Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends, friends of Baylor. Let me put my coffee down. <laughs> Rough morning. Too much, too much uh, partying this week. Okay. Uh, so I want to start with uh, TEFI data, the Texas Epidemic Public Health Institute. We do a lot of wastewater sampling, and one of our viewers actually pointed out that not every municipality is covered, which is true and unfortunate. So it would be great if we did everybody. We should do it nationally, but we only get the municipalities that are interested in, in doing it. So uh, measles has been detected in the wastewater in Lubbock and El Paso, uh, and rotavirus and parainfluenza three levels continue to be quite high. So influenza B is finally falling down, so influenza A and B are sort of out of season now. But the other viruses that cause colds and all that kind of stuff, human metanumavirus, parvo-19, uh, parainfluenza three are high. And while SARS is not, not very high, I just wanted to remind, one of our viewers sent this in about themselves, and it reminded me of my son who went to Brazil. He you know, had a great time, except he got sick, and it was COVID-19. And uh, this person commented that, uh, you know, they've been listening to me and hearing about all these other respiratory viruses and thought, you know, they got a cold, and just go, went home and tested, turned out to be COVID. So one point that this viewer reminded uh, me to, and suggested I remind people, we're treating these, all these respiratory viruses the same now, like flu or COVID or any of the other um, upper respiratory viruses you might get, is stay home. When you're sick, stay home because there's no reason to infect your coworkers. I mean, don't wear a mask, just, <laughs> just stay home until you're, until you're no longer symptomatic. That is basically the recommendations we have for flu. And thank you to the two viewers who called in those two comments, both of them uh, very smart, very good comments. Okay, so measles is still the main thing going on in the country, although we seem to have me, uh, have a, an outbreak of whooping cough too, but I will t I'll do that next week. But this week, measles up to 884 cases, 11% are being hospitalized, there are three deaths already. And if you look at the yearly measles cases, uh, you know, the biggest number was in, 19, was in 2019, Right before the COVID pandemic was 1,200, now it's up to 884, and I am sure we will break that record. And it's based on where, who's got 95% more or more vaccinated. We've talked about this a million times. Our number's at 18. That means that in order to prevent outbreaks, you have to have 95% of the population vaccinated. And the rest of the world, there's plenty of measles around. So if you travel internationally and you have a susceptible person, either you or your children are susceptible, mostly it's the children who haven't gotten vaccinated, they are likely to come into contact with this in Europe, and then all of a sudden you'll, you're, you'll get it and you'll bring it in, there'll be outbreaks in your community. Most recent outbreaks are in Louisiana, Missouri, and Virginia. Texas, of course, still leads the nation. We always like to lead the nation on all things, including measles, 663 cases of measles now. Uh, and most of the cases, it's, I mean, actually, it's pretty evenly distributed. Uh, between under the age of four is 200, five to 17, 245, 18 and over 194. Vast majority, as we've said, are in unvaccinated people. The vaccine is 96, 97% efficacious. So it's the 3% that have their immunity wane and, and uh, are getting it uh, who, who were vaccinated. But the vast majority are unvaccinated. So I, I wanted to look at the Kaiser Family Foundation. They're, the, they're actually the best sort of standard for polling opinions. And uh, with all the issues around measles and not understanding vaccination or the importance of vaccination, I pulled up this one paper by them to look at, you know, awareness of what's going on in the community in terms of measles vaccine. So, you know, is the, most of the public is aware of measles cases that are currently higher than in previous years. Is that true? So what surprises me, it's 56% only. I would think everybody would know this, but only 56% of the country knows that. 28% are unsure, 10% think it's lower than in previous years. So there's still a pretty sizable population in our country who's unaware that we're in the middle of a big outbreak for measles. And some think it's actually less than usual. Uh, now this one, bothers me a lot because it says the share of adults who say they've heard false claims that measles vaccines are more dangerous than measles itself, that is increased. So, 
uh, people, obviously the anti-vaccine world is getting this message out better because it used to be only 18 or 19% in 20, March 24. In April 25, a third of the population have heard these claims that, that measles vaccines is actually more dangerous than getting the disease itself, which is just, the, just in, I'm not going to say it's stupid, but it's just incorrect. At least half of the public are uncertain when it comes to false claims about measles saying such claims are either probably true or probably false. So here's one. Measles, mumps, rubella vaccines, also known as the MMR vaccines, have been proven to cause autism. That's the one, you know, it was one person published in Lancet. It was totally disproved. It was made, actually it was falsified data by a person who was working to prevent vaccines and it was later retracted by Lancet. And yet that one paper continues to go around. So 21% think it's probably true. So that's a, that's a problem. 41% <laughs> say probably false, but 30, only 34% think it's definitely false. All right, getting measles is more dangerous than becoming infected with me. Getting the measles vaccine is more dangerous than becoming infected with measles. Only, and 16% say that's probably true. I mean, that's, that's amazing. So more people think that you're worse off getting the vaccine than being infected. That's 16% of the population. Vitamin A, I went over vitamin A, what was that, last week or two weeks ago? Vitamin A, which is not effective at treating measles, vitamin A could prevent measles infections. 23% say it's probably true. So that shows you that, you know, the, the false information, misinformation that's being spread around is getting some traction. There are people who actually believe this stuff, which is why we have problems with getting more of the population vaccinated. Eight in 10 adults and parents say they are confident our vaccines are safe. 48% are very confident, 35% some are confident, 10% not at all. So that's pretty good. I mean, the one good news is that 90% of the population, of course, we need 95% of kids vaccinated to prevent outbreaks. So 90% is good, but not good enough. And so one of our own, Dr. Hotez, had a paper, recent paper. I've been, you know, I've gone through this with you many times, how... Uh, and, and our value of 18 need, means 95% of the population needs to be infected to prevent outbreaks. Well, he published a paper with a bunch of authors in JAMA Network uh, where they simulated how long it would take for uh, measles to become endemic again. In other words, it would be every year all over the place. Uh, and without a 5%, and it's according to predictions from the simulation module, Without a 5% higher measles, mumps, and rubella vaccinated rate, MMR vaccinated rate, rate we will revert to end endemicity or become endemic. Uh, that's because, we, I've to shown you many times, 95% or more is required to prevent outbreaks. We're at about 90% nationally. Some states are much lower than that, but that's going to mean that we're going to continue to have these. A 10% decline in vaccination could lead to 11 million cases of measles. So if you start thinking about what the impact of having this vaccination rate drop, it gets to be endemic, and we have millions and millions of cases. A 5% increase that brought us back up to 95% would mean that we're around closer to 5,800 cases. So interesting modeling just showing if we don't get our acts together, we're going to have measles endemic again. And when, when we just, you know, in 2002, eliminated it from this country, anyway. So this is what else is going on with respiratory diseases. It's the, pretty much the season is over. These are various uh, years. You can see this season in red, we're pretty much out of the main respiratory uh, symptom, respiratory disease uh, season, which is always in the, for flu is always in the winter and ends around March. If you look at COVID data, it's still, it's still detected in wastewater, but it's pretty low. And as I just want to mention, you know, cause COVID, COVID even though there was a huge COVID uh, season this year, much less than flu, just as many people died from COVID as died from flu because it's a much more serious respiratory disease. So as of April 5th, though, you can see, you know, or April 12th, it was, it was down pretty well. But we did have some, you know, we did have some deaths this year from COVID. Wastewater activity, it's detectable, but low. All right, next, next week we'll talk about um, pertussis. Anyway. <laughs> Lily, Lily, <laughs> she's sound asleep. I do this to her. I start talking, she goes to sleep. Anyway, I want to end this week with some shout-outs. First of all, a lot of good stuff happened to our scientists. 
Uh, congratulations to Peggy Goodell, the professor and chair of the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology. She was elected to the National Academy of Sciences this week. She was also elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the AAAS, last week. So good, good things for Dr. Goodell, well-deserved, fantastic scientist. Also, congratulations to Dr. Carl Allen, professor of pediatrics and co-director of the Pediatric Cancer Program in the Dan L. Duncan Cancer Center. He was elected to the American Association of Physicians. That's a very prestigious society. I was there for his dinner and induction. It was very nice. Uh, and we talked about um, Fasia last week. She was also inducted to the AAP. This week is, uh, and today is Alumni Reunion Weekend. Starts on Thursday night, starts on Thursday night, and will be through this whole weekend. It's great to have so many graduates coming back. We have a big uh, group of people, almost 200 folks coming back to, to visit. Uh, and a big shout out to Dr. Kim Millar, class of 84. She recently sent me uh, a framed glass etching of the Cullen Building, our original building here in the Texas Medical Center, the first uh, founding building, and it's a beautiful Art Deco building. And now on the historical registry, that's the, the original Cullen Building. And she has a beautiful uh, lithograph that she sent me. So thank you very much for that. Really appreciate it. I'm putting it in the president's office so I can look at it all the time. So thank you, uh, Dr. Millar. Anyway, uh, have a great weekend. Have a wonderful uh, reunion weekend this weekend for all the alums coming back. And I can't wait to see you next week.